the veil would be removed from their heart, that they would give their heart over to your son, Jesus Christ. We love you, we thank you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray, and amen. Guys, this morning we're going to continue in our series entitled Freedom in Christ. Now, as I've already mentioned a couple times, the goal in this series, folks, it's twofold. Number one, we want the seed of the gospel to go forth. And we want God to give the increase. And number two, we want to remind believers of the freedom that they have in Jesus Christ. Now, much of what we hear about today is centered around the subject of freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, all of that stuff. But we live in a society that does not have a clue about what what true freedom is really is all about. I don't know if you guys saw last night on the news the riots that have broken out in St. Louis, Missouri. All under the name of freedom, these individuals that are protesting and are rioting are going down the streets of St. Louis, Missouri and busting out windows out of businesses. All done in the name of freedom. Now listen to me, guys. I don't want you to get me wrong this morning. I praise God for the freedoms that we have in this country, but we abuse the freedoms that have been graciously given to us. And when freedom, folks, is abused, then freedom will die. And it's not difficult to look around and see how freedom has been abused in our country. Just look at the high crime rates. Look at the abuse of alcohol. Look at the abuse of drugs just in our community alone. But instead of reining these things in, what we do is we make laws that allow freedom to abuse these things. We make more laws that allow these people to abuse the freedom that they've been given. That's what we do as a country. Freedom, listen to me folks, is not the ability to do whatever you want to do. It's not freedom from authority. It is not freedom from responsibility. Listen, it is not freedom from indulging in the flesh. And it is also not freedom to ignore the law of God. Now some people think because the Apostle Paul said that we have been set free from the law that we no longer need to obey the moral law of God. But folks, we've been set free from the bondage of the law. True freedom is to be found in Jesus Christ. True uh, freedom is to do as you should do. After all, Jesus Christ said, If you love me, you'll what? Keep my commandments. Folks, we need to understand something this morning, that we are by nature slaves. We are slaves to sin, and by nature we are slaves to this world system where we live. But God wants you to be free. Jesus Christ uh, teaching from the synagogues in His hometown of Nazareth, He said this, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty. What's that word mean, church? Freedom. Say it again, church. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives. Folks, we've already seen throughout this series that Jesus Christ is the one that has brought freedom and through and and by His atoning death on the cross and by putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and His finished work, we can be set free. We can be set free from the penalty of sin. We can be set free from the power of sin. And folks, one of these days, we're going to be set free from the presence of sin. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Thank you for playing along. The second week, we saw an example of a lady that was bound down because of an issue of blood. She spent 12 long years trying to break those chains, and the Bible says that when she put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that immediately, immediately she was set free. And if Jesus Christ is the picture of freedom, if true freedom is found in Jesus Christ, then for us, true freedom is to be conformed to the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's where we find true freedom at. I want to read the text for you one more time before we get started. The Scripture says, Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit 
of the Lord. You see, the key to this whole thing, church, is the Spirit. Who is that Spirit? Well, look down there at verse 17. It says, the Lord is that Spirit. Folks, at Bloomingdale Salem Baptist Church, we believe in the Trinity. We believe in the Godhead. I'm referring to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one and one in three. Three persons all equally make up one God. And even though they are one, they are three distinct persons that are all on the same level. All three of them are to be worshipped as God. Listen to me. When we sing praises unto Him, when we stand up and testify, when we raise our hands, when we sing His holy name, we are singing and praising to all three of them. Amen? We worship the Godhead. And make no mistake, the Holy Spirit, folks, it is not an it. He is a person. The Holy Spirit is a he. It's not an it. Everybody says, well, let's worship it. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's a him. And since the Holy Spirit is a person, then the Holy Spirit has a personality. The Holy Spirit has a mind, Romans 8, 27. And He, referring to Jesus, that searcheth the hearts, knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit searches out the human mind, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things. The Holy Spirit has a will, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. The Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit spoke to Philip in the desert, and the Holy Spirit spoke to Peter on a rooftop. The Holy Spirit loves, Romans 15, verse 30, and for the love of the Spirit. And in John chapter 16, actually all throughout the upper room discourse, you can go from John chapter 13 all the way to John chapter 17, Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would come. I want to read you just a passage. Actually, flip over to John 16. I want you to see this. John 16. Look there starting in verse 7. John chapter 16, starting in verse 7. When you're there, say amen. amen. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter, that word there meaning advocate, it's one that comes alongside to help. It's one that stands up and testifies for another individual. It says, will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin. Now, let me just stop. Right here is the Spirit's relationship to the world. And when he comes, he'll reprove or convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Look at verse 13. Here's the Spirit's, rela uh, the Spirit's relationship to the believer. He says, How bet when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you in all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall receive of Mine, and shall show it, unto you. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Why do we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because Spirit-filled people, folks, are instructed people. The Spirit leads us and guides us and directs us and instructs us and teaches us. The Spirit leads us and teaches us in truth because every single thing the Spirit does glorifies Jesus Christ. The Spirit does doesn't come talking about himself. The Spirit doesn't abide in you talking about himself. The Spirit points everything to Jesus Christ. And people today, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for a religion that's absent of truth. They're looking for a religion that brings about bondage. They want to follow a set of rules. But listen to me. The Bible right here says the Spirit brings about freedom. Amen? Uh, look at verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit... And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Do you guys mind if I use the word freedom there? 
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Whew. Folks, I love that. Here's why. Because most of us would have expected the Apostle Paul to say, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's love. Or where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's truth. Or where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's unity. Or where the Spirit of the Lord is, here's the fruits of the Spirit. But we need to understand something this morning, church. We need to understand that the first mark of the Holy Spirit dwelling in our lives is freedom. Then comes love. Then comes truth. And then comes unity. Why is this so important? Because many of you are not walking in the true freedom that has been provided for you. Did you know that? Did you know that there's Christians walking around all over the place that are not living a victorious Christian life because the flesh is getting in the way? They're not tapping into everything that's been provided for them. They're not accessing the freedom that's been provided to them through and by the Holy Spirit. I want you to look there at verse 15 and 16. The Bible says this. Actually, flip back to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 15 and 16, if you're not already there. But even unto this day... When Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Folks, we need to get this right here. If if we get anything this morning, we need to get this. Because in our natural condition, there is a veil that covers our heart. That word veil, the, uh, the word veil there, it simply means a covering. But Paul is referring to their unbelief. You see, the problem lies within our hearts. These people are spiritually blind. These people's hearts have been hardened. They don't hear it. They don't have the ears to hear, as Jesus said. They're spiritually blind. They don't hear the Word of God. When the, when, when the Word of God is preached, when the Word of God is taught, it's like the seed that, that falls on the trodden down path. The birds immediately take it, and it's immediately gone. But listen, when the heart turns to the Lord and the veil is taken away, folks, that can happen. The veil can only be removed through and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And from the cross, Jesus said, Keith, He said, it's finished. Did He not? You see, the work's been done. The way has been provided to every single one of us through and by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the atoning death on the cross. So now there's nothing else that can set us free. It's only through the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And listen to me. God wants you to be free from sin. He wants you to be free from the guilt of sin. But that only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. It happens when the Holy Spirit of God takes the Word of God, I'm referring to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and begins to show you its truth and begins to apply it to your heart. Folks, do you know? If it, you wouldn't even know that you were a sinner if it weren't for two things. Number one, the law of God. You see, the Bible says that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. If it wasn't for the law, you would never see where you need to stack up. You would never see that you missed the mark. What is the mark? The mark's Jesus Christ. The mark is the perfect, sinless Son of Man. That's number one. And the other thing is the work of the Holy Spirit because the, the Holy Spirit takes the law and applies it to your heart and convicts you of sin. I want you to look down there. It says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Notice this. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, is. He's not talking about a geographical location. Now, it's true that God's omnipresent. It's true that that God is everywhere. And the Holy Spirit of God is the exact same way. But listen to what the psalmist said. The psalmist said, Where shall I go from thy spirit? Or where shall I flee from the presence of the Spirit? You see, the writer of the psalm understood that the Spirit was never going to flee from him. He, he, he understood the Spirit's keeping power. He understood that the Spirit would never leave him, nor forsake him. But Paul says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Let me ask you a question, church. Where is He? Where is the Spirit? Say that out loud, man. Say it again. Oh, praise God. Praise God. If you're a believer this morning, listen to me. The Spirit of God dwells right here 
in your heart. Do you know what that means? That means the Spirit of God is here right now dwelling inside of each and every single believer that's here today. You see, the Bible says, Know you not that you're a temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Folks, this is absolutely foundational to Christianity. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 5.1, Stand fast in the freedom wherewith Christ has made you free. This is the birthright of every single Christian that's ever been born again. And by the way, there is no other kind of Christian. But where the Holy Spirit of God is found, there you will also find freedom. Why is that? But, Tom, that's because the Holy Spirit of God dwells inside of us. Dwells within our hearts. And listen to me, folks. Every Christian is free. Everyone is free. But not every Christian understands that they've been set free. Do you know that when slavery was abolished in America, that they had to continually, over and over and over again, go back and tell these slaves that they had been set free? But these slaves have been slaves for so long, their biggest problem was is that they had a slave mentality. It had been ingrained inside of them. And we have Christians running around all over the place with a slave mentality. And folks, we need to understand that we've been set free. Amen? Set free from what? Set free from the bondage of law. Set free from sin and the guilt of sin. We've been set free from the power of death. That does not mean that you can do whatever you want to do. It means that you have the freedom to do as you're supposed to do in Jesus Christ. That means you have the freedom to serve. That means you have the freedom to be obedient. That means you have the freedom to go out and witness. That means you have the freedom to worship. And listen to me, church. That means you have the freedom to raise your hands and praise His holy name. Amen. Amen. If you want to clap, if you want to raise your hands, if you want to stand up and shout, whatever it is, you have the freedom to do that. Now listen, the Spirit's a perfect gentleman. The Spirit will make you do nothing. He's a perfect gentleman. However, the Spirit may say, Hey, why don't you praise Him? Why don't you praise His holy name? Amen? You see, listen to this. Psalm 86, 12. I will praise Thee. Oh, Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. Listen to Psalm 150. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with psaltery and harp. Praise Him with the tremble and dance. Praise Him with stringed instruments and organs. Praise Him upon loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. You say, Chris, I'm praising Him when I pray. Man, I've got a great prayer life. And every time I pray, that's the first thing I do is I praise Him. Praise God. That's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be going to Him in thanksgiving. But the psalmist also says this, church, and listen to me carefully. I will declare the name unto my brethren, and in the midst of the congregation, I will praise Thee. You see, the Holy Spirit of God gives you freedom to do as you should do. The problem is, is getting the flesh out of the way. Could you imagine what, what we would see? Could you imagine how we would see God work if we would just get the flesh out of the way? You see, and listen to me, the more that we're conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, the more that we have the power to deny the flesh. That's what we call, it's a real fancy word, sanctification. The only thing that means is after you're saved, you begin to grow. You begin to strengthen. You're, you're able to fight off the temptations that Satan knows that you have. That means you get to the point... Where you say, you know, I don't care. I'm not talking about what anybody else thinks about you outside the walls. Because you ought to care. You ought to be careful the way you act towards those that are without. But you also get to the point where you say, you know what? I don't care what anybody thinks about me praising God. And you shouldn't. You should not care, church. You shouldn't care. But I want you to look there at verse 18. Look what he says. He says, but we all, 
What's that word all mean in the Greek? It means all. With open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. This means those that have been, uh, uh, had, had, had the veil removed. You know that veil we just talked about that covers the heart, that causes unbelief, that causes uh, uh, deafness and blindness. That same veil, you see, when that veil is removed, we are like a mirror showing forth the glory of God and the Spirit will make us more and more like Him and we are transformed into His image. Romans chapter 8 says, For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Folks, we are created in the image of God and we are designed to be like Christ. That's our original factory design. Have, have you guys ever looked at your book inside the glove compartment of, of, of your car? I mean, if there's something wrong with it, you go back to the manual, right? You pop that thing out and you can see how that car, how that vehicle was designed to be. You are created in the image of God. Every single one of you. And you are designed to be Christ-like. We are designed to be changed into the image of Jesus Christ. How are we changed into the image of Jesus Christ? It's through walking in the Spirit. It's obedience to God's Word because it's within the Word that we discover the things that cause us to walk in the Spirit. Folks, when you're in the Word of God, when you're studying the Word of God, when you hear the Word of God taught, when you hear it preached, then the Spirit of God will take the Word of God and He will begin to shape and mold your life into the image of Jesus Christ. And folks, when you become conformed, when you begin to become conformed to the image of Jesus, folks, that's freedom. That's where you will discover true freedom. Listen to 1 John 3, 2. He said, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doeth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. Did you guys hear that? When He shall appear, we shall be like Him. You see, folks, this is a process. This doesn't happen overnight. We're not made exactly like Him until the day of eternity. You see, the Bible says, being confident of this one thing, that He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Folks, if you've been saved, then you've merely begun the process. But the more and more you grow, the more and more you become like Jesus Christ, and the more and more you become like Christ, the more freer you end up being. Amen? Listen, if you've not been saved, then you're still in slavery. Let me ask you a question. The scripture I read says this, When He shall appear, we shall be like Him. Are you ready for the appearing? The other passage I read, Philippians 1.6 says this, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Are you ready for the day of Jesus Christ? Are you ready for his appearing? Are you ready for the day of Jesus Christ? You see, folks, the Bible says that he's going to come like a thief in the night. If you've never begun the growing process, if the Holy Spirit of God is not dwelling in your heart, which means that you've never been saved, that means you're not ready. Let me read you. A familiar passage in Luke chapter 11. I don't want you to flip there. I just want you to listen. It's a familiar passage. I've probably read it a million times. But listen to what he says. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Is the Spirit knocking on your door today? Because it's through the Spirit and through the Word of God that He will begin to, to work inside of your heart. He'll begin to remove that veil. Is He knocking on your door today? You see, if He is, then, then you need to knock back. You see, the handle's only on your side. Let me read you another passage over in uh, Romans chapter 6. I want you to flip to this one. Romans chapter 6. I promise you I'm about to close. Romans chapter 6. I 
When you're there, say I'm there. What then? Starting in verse 15. Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey. See, there's that word servant, slave. His servants ye are known to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart. Obeyed from the what, church? From the what? You mean there's obedience that takes place in the heart? You mean freedom? Isn't the freedom to do whatever you want, but it's to do as you should do, obeying from the heart? He says, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, but as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness and unto holiness, referring really to sanctification. The growing process we were just talking about, being conformed to the image of Jesus. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Did you guys hear that? For when you were the servants of sin. Does anybody remember that time? When you were a servant of sin. You know what I'm saying, Tom? That's what you served. You were looking for satisfaction in all kinds of different areas, but you couldn't find it. You couldn't find anything to satisfy your soul. You couldn't find anything to, to appease that longing that you had within you. And, 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 and you would just go from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, and you continued to look, but you still couldn't find it. You may even looked in religion. You may even looked in Christianity, but still, you were never saved and you couldn't find it. You see, you were servants to sin. You were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. It ends in death. But, <laughs> verse 22, Now, being made free from sin and becoming servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness in the end, everlasting life. How can you be made free and then all of a sudden become a servant? How does that happen? It's because when you've been made free, you now have the freedom to serve after Christ and to do what He says that we ought to be doing. That's where true freedom is found. For listen, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Do you have that gift? I mean, do you really have it? Is Christ in you and you're in Christ? Ask yourself that this morning. Be honest with yourself. Are you living for Him? Have you given your life to Him and you just haven't began to grow so you, you're not understanding the freedom that's actually been afforded to you through the Holy Spirit of God? You see, if that's you, you can take care of every single bit of this today. Amen? I'm not going to tarry. I believe enough in the sovereignty of God to know that you're going to get saved whether I ask you or not. Amen? So let's all please rise. Father, we want to thank you. We want to thank you once again for the service that you've given us today. Father, we want to thank you for, for the Holy Spirit. And Father, we want to thank you that through the Holy Spirit of God, there's freedom. And everywhere the Spirit is, there's freedom. And Father, we want to thank You that the Spirit of God dwells within our hearts. Father, we want to thank You that, that the Spirit will never leave us. The Spirit will never forsake us. And Father, everywhere we go, we take the Spirit with us. Oh, Father, we want to thank You and praise You for that. Father, we want to thank You that the Holy Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. And He leads us down the roads of truth. And He leads us down the, the roads of righteousness. And Father, we want to thank You that the Holy Spirit of God convicts. 
and reproves of sin and righteousness and judgment. And Father, we pray that we would be a group of believers that, that would allow the Holy Spirit of God to, to have His will and to have His way throughout this body. And Father, we, we ask You if there's someone here today that needs to take care of business, Father, we pray that You would give them the courage, the strength, and the power. We know that You haven't given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. We thank You for that. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And amen.